Senator McKenna's. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Hamill. I appreciate this uh, fabulous piece of work. I'm probably as excited uh, uh, of hearing this report as any report I've heard since I've been here uh, because it acknowledges what many of us in rural North Carolina have always thought but didn't have any uh, credentials or any evidence uh, to, uh, to, in, uh, to create an indictment for a conviction of the facts that we have here. Uh, have you uh, been able to uh, uh, create a model at this point, or am I premature in this question, as to what this would look like if we followed through on the recommendations uh, that you bring forth here today as it relates to the current uh, allocation versus the, the new proposed allocations on an LEA basis? <laughs> We did not go as far as uh, creating a model. The charge of the evaluation was to look at what we currently have and consider the feasibility of an alternative model. I think our, our last finding shows it's, it's absolutely feasible uh, and the other 43 states have shown that it's absolutely feasible. Um, from there, it's this body's charge to determine and weigh whether or not that's in the state's uh, benefit to transition from there. We've recommended that if indeed that is the direction wants to go in, there needs to be a consensus of, of members. And that's why we recommended a task force. Uh, and it even identified that it, there may be some professional consultation that's needed. There are academics uh, all over the country, as well as uh, folks that the Education Commission for the states that do this sort of work that help lead states through the process of uh, transition. Do you have an opinion? on the cost of uh, the current administration uh, of the way we do this versus what the potential savings would be in administrative cost uh, if we move to the new model. Uh, just just uh, uh, an idea, would there be significant savings or do you think it would be a wash? We don't have an idea of the, the cost savings from transitioning to a new model. Um, obviously in the short term, uh, it may it may be costly. We may need the facilitation, the, the professional consultation. The the current model that's in place is is quite honestly run on a on a bare bones staff that works very hard over at DPI to implement this massive system. So the actual administrative cost of administering a system like this isn't necessarily the problem. Um, it is uh, the problem is inherent in how the structure of allotments. Uh, determine how resources are distributed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, if I might, let me recognize Mr. Turcotte. He has a comment on the student-based modeling. Uh, Senator McGinnis in Florida, where I was for many years, um, Florida has a student-based model. It's called the Florida Education Funding Financial Formula, FEFP. And <clears throat> Over time, what, what tends to happen with these formulas, in the beginning, the most difficult part is what is an adequate amount per student, that base amount. And hours and hours go into discussion of that. And the, the, I can't tell you how complicated the debate and political part about that is, OK? so. It seems relatively simple. You take uh, what you're currently spending per student and then average it and what, but it doesn't, uh, it's, that's the rub in the very beginning. The other thing is, <clears throat> and Sean brought this out, the ratios of weightings. Surprisingly, there's, there's, you know, there's always research or something you can use to base those weightings. Now here's what, here's what happens over time. You start out with this with this weighted formula, and the districts begin to get the funding, and then different interest groups will come in and say, "Well, they're not spending the money, even though they got the weighted amount. They're not spending it in that category." And so, instead of relying on the LEAs to correct that politically on a local level, they come to the general assembly or the legislature and ad advocate a categorical. So you sort of have to, over time, if you get a system like this, you have to hold the line on those categoricals. But you get very intense debate on that. Uh, and I know in Florida what happens 
it's hard for a, for someone to argue against uh, categoricals for say disability or special needs students. So they'll you see you get a pressure for that, and it's hard to say well you shouldn't get a categorical for that. So it, it's um, it's a little different. It is it is different, and it it uh, you almost need to have somebody get you ready mentally for the <laughs> for the, for that side of it because it's it's uh, it's difficult and I know uh, in Virginia they commissioned our counterpart up there to come up with once and for all what is an amount that would adequately educate a student and uh, the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission staff spent uh, nearly a year and came up with that amount and the legislature adopted that amount so I just said that just in the way of background because uh, a lot of things are deceptively simple but they're actually not and I suspect that is why the recommendation number one is to refer this at least in part to a commission who would do that is that a fair statement okay, okay um, I have Senator Heiss Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as assuming we're hopefully moving very quickly to a recommendation for legislation, there's a few questions. I just kind of wanted to clarify with it. Um, the joint task force, and this is simply a date question, um, you've put a date on of July. Uh, is there any reason you think that couldn't, we could not accelerate that so it would be available for the short session? So that we're talking uh, March or April uh, timeline in there, more than we're talking in July. Um, given um, that any, any sort of legislation that would potentially come out of this uh, long session that you know, comes out quickly and gets signed by um, administration, we get to work on it almost immediately. Um, this, these dates were predicated on the thought that we most likely wouldn't see any sort of legislation until probably the end of a long session. And what that would then do is give um, about a year uh, to move through this. Uh, we foresee a number of meetings um, that would need to happen as well as some very heavy lifting in terms of uh, current analytics of, of allotment amounts to arrive at those base amounts. And again, there may need to be procurement of outside consultation. But always, if the General Assembly wants us to march a little bit quicker, we're happy to march a little bit quicker, but this is this is a heavy lift. Thank you. Um, and I understand that, but I think that uh, there's some reasons in there to move, and hopefully we'll be out very early in the long session of running plenty of time, hopefully, uh, to do that. Um, Second question on the uh, low wealth supplemental funding formula. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I fully understand eliminating the uh, property tax per square mile factor uh, mm -hmm. that's coming in, or as I say, the non mountain uh, funding formula uh, that's coming in. Uh, what was the decision to moving it to an equal weight between anticipated revenue and uh, per capita income versus? heavier weighting it towards per capita income as it is low wealth uh, in that funding area. Part of that decision was um, talking with experts uh, within the education finance and then referring this to other states that do that. Um, while many uh, states that provide low wealth rely exclusively on um, uh, property, property tax, our state chooses to, to look at income. Um, obviously, if, if the General Assembly wants to look at shifting those weights a little bit more, we kind of just took what was left and provided equal weighting uh, to both of them. And the final question I want to have in kind of getting this legislation going, um, would it be, I think we've got a sense it's possible, but uh, what are the challenges for asking program evaluation to develop possibly even multi-models that would be available at the begin at this October date uh, that the committee could re begin to review versus only then starting the process of how to come up with a model? Uh, how do we get them to a place where they can adjust a model uh, for certain factors versus 
starting that process. I think the response to that punch is above my weight class, so I'll uh, let my director. I prefer to give you some term rather than weight. In, in our, maybe intellect, perhaps. Yeah, that's what I'm okay. uh, we could do that. Uh, it might require some temporary resources, but we certainly can do that. And I don't see there. It's impossible to do to support a task force like that unless you can do what I call sensitivity analysis. As you get an idea and you run it through the model. Uh, but this has been done in other places. So yes, we could do that. Okay, uh, Senator Bingham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the question I have on this goes along with what Senator Heiss has mentioned, but on the low wealth supplemental funding. Yes. Um, I served a term as county commissioner and uh, that was the worst job I've ever had. But, <laughs> Um, but at any rate, were you on time for those meetings? <laughs> no, but I want to explain something here. What happened in Davidson County on on this um, average per capita? Because each year the uh, the board was very conservative, and so they had a relative to other surrounding counties. They had the lowest tax rate. Of course, we had a lot of jobs and industries come into the county because of that. But as far as the um, DPI and that funding level, they pushed hard to um, get the county commissioners to raise their tax rate 10 cents. Well, some of the ones who even discussed this or talked about it, they didn't return. And so I could see, I don't know if we're talking about trumping the county commissioners on their tax rate and set, set up some kind of a, a legitimate number if, for example, you do have a county that has a uh, relatively low rate relative to the other counties. You know, some people would argue that, you know, they're sensible in the decisions they make are conservative, but others may say that, you know, would you address that, please? Sure. I think, I mean, the inclusion of um, per capita income is, is, is logical, right? It's the property tax is not the, uh, is not the exclusive source of local revenue. Uh, and so the inclusion of looking at uh, income, uh, it, it, like I said, it's logical. Um, I think to Senator Heiss's question is, what sort of weighting uh, do we give it? The, the, the vast majority of revenue comes from property taxes. And so providing equal weighting doesn't necessarily recognize where the vast majority comes from. The other thing that we see is we have wide variability in uh, income tax. Right? It, it ranges far greater within a county than, say, property tax does. And so providing equal weighting to the both, to the both doesn't necessarily recognize that variability. Um, but again, we're, we're happy to look at um, how to tweak and uh, what different weighting may look like. But if it's the inclination of the General Assembly to move in the direction uh, of, of, of thinking about a different way of doing all of this, well, then tinkering with the current allotment kind of becomes new. Senator uh, Bingham, in some states where they use what's called a minimum foundation model, they factor in a local contribution that's mandatory, and the uh, you have to look at each county or each district's relative wealth in doing that as and you and they go through a fairly complicated initial um, study to see what that means in other words they got to come up with an index of, it's called the local contribution index in Mississippi and <clears throat> what happens that contribution becomes the local school amount and it's it's put into the overall fund and then it's reallo it's allocated back based on either on a per student model or a resource allocation model depending on what, what states use. But it, the, it's difficult if you separate out local taxation like we do here in North Carolina and it isn't necessarily tied into the total amount the state makes available, you can get these dislocations. But I'm saying if we, if we do go into something like that, uh, you're in for a real battle royal on, on how to set that local contribution. Because suddenly the state is determining what is being put on in the way of levies, school levies, on the local level. So. 
uh, Senator Pate. And that leads to my question, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we're we're going to be faced with county commissioners, school boards, the administrators, all saying whatever happened to local control. And uh, it seems to me that's going to be a big battle if we get into this, but it might be worth might be worth doing. Okay. Uh, other representative form. I saw your hand. Yeah. This is a huge lift, no matter what. It's in fact a huge lift to just doing what we already do, given political considerations and and the interest statewide uh, in every piece of this report. The um, the response by DPI alone, just reading the response, is a clear indication of how complex the issue is. And unquestionably, I think we would all agree that there are very few people, parents, teachers, the tr legislators, that truly understand how our funding system for public education works. And, and we're all oh, very much aware of the challenges in appropriate funding for charter schools. So, we can choose to, as we often do, do nothing and continue down our merry way, but that's not the message the voter is sending us in this state or across the nation. We need to come to grips with how we fund education and what we, and, and by, the, by that, communicate what we expect what, from the education process. So um, first, I'd like to commend uh, the entire PED organization, particularly Sean Hamill and, and the group that worked specifically on this. But my guess is they all chimed in. This is a huge deal. And as, as was said in the beginning, 30% of our total budget in K-12, total, total annual budget. These are people's lives we're dealing with here. This is not some arm length concept. And it's the future of our state. One could maybe be expansive and say the nation because of the mobility of students. So the decisions we're going to make with this as a, as a consequence of this report are hugely important. Um, I'm I'm really appreciative of this dive, but recognize, as we all do, the political considerations. Just think back over the last couple of years as we went on through the budget, the political considerations on small county, low wealth, hold harmless, and the phone calls that each one of us will get tonight, tomorrow, come here, I need to talk to you, you gotta help me out. This is going to be going to be tough, really tough. So uh, again, I, I wanted to voice my appreciation. I'm prepared to make a motion, but I'm anxious to know if anyone else has more to say before I do. But just to give you an idea of what's on my mind, I believe that that. We, the legislature, both houses, both parties, everybody else, we need to take, continue this deep dive, get input, but as Senator Heiss said, keep us on a short leash. Let's get on with it. And it is, it, it falls to us. We've just finished an election. Voters said, now get up there and do something. So it falls to us. I'm, I'll go ahead and, and put a motion on the table. I move that, that the Joint Legislative Program Evaluation Oversight Committee direct staff to prepare a draft bill based on recommendation one of the report for, for so that we can take action at our next meeting in December. 
That recommendation one, as you will recall, creates the joint task force. Let's get on with it. I'll take that motion and then we'll take, uh, I saw your hand a moment ago, Representative Carney, and I want to recognize you. It was not, <laughs> it can speak to either way. I mean, that's because uh, I think if we need to have something on the floor and that's what yeah, we have. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was sitting here looking at the summary recommendations just spelled out real simply on page four, four slide 40. And that is we have two choices. One is overhaul, and the other is reform. And I'm not sure that I've concluded today uh, that we know what reforming would look like. Um, we know what's been proposed of what overhauling would look like, and that's the weighted system. Um, I heard uh, Chairman Horn's comments about the two legislative bodies need to get to work. I agree, I agree, this is a huge issue. And it's something that's been out there since I've been here for 14 years. Um, but I, I wonder about the makeup of the task force. And are we going broad enough, are we making it just the legislators, 18 up here, deter well, 20 counting the co-chairs making that determination without others at the table with us. I know in coordination with DPI and others. But what about those, the superintendents? Um, I, I mean, I think I'm saying I would be open to expanding the task force to include others that have a skin in this game, that have the boots on the ground approach, that have been in this for years. And so I'm just throwing that option out there to uh, look at makeup, restructuring the makeup of this task force. I agree that that, uh, that recommendation should move forward, that, that we get a task force moving to address this. And, it, and it's, you're right, Chairman Horn, it's going to be a political battle. But I think if we've got other people at the table, than just the legislators. It might help us in moving anything forward. But I also would like to have some look at what reform would look like versus total overhaul. Uh, uh, Representative Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I too concur that we need to move forward with something. I'm not quite sure though that we ought to move with uh, expeditious speed. This is a tremendous challenge and especially when we consider the current makeup of the task force. It's going to right now be made up of legislators, and I'm not so sure that we're going to come up with legislators. I don't know who they're going to be, given the atmosphere of the the court atmosphere of what the legislature's going to look like. We don't know this time next year that the same folk are going to be here. We just don't know. So, I would advise us to really look at this with caution. And I too think that we need to consider the other forces, such as uh, those who really implement this thing, uh, the, the school systems themselves, and uh, the general public, the parents, the business interest industry. I don't know how many we ought to include, but if we're going to have a task force, it probably we do well to have more than just legislators involved in this. Okay, other questions? Uh, Representative, or Senator Heiss, excuse me. Um, in addressing those, I don't disagree that this task force should uh, have individuals that are outside of legislators, and I think 
it'd be a huge miss if it didn't bring in superintendents or finance officers, probably more accurately, and DPI and others. Um, I think with the concept of it introducing legislation for the short session, uh, it's probably more important. Um, I think one of the things we're looking at is if the legislature changes in a year, you, you may have a lot of legislators here who have no ability to introduce legislation because uh, they can't introduce it in the short session unless it passed both. So I think you've got to get a point. It's got to come back to a committee in there uh, and do those if they can introduce it. So you'd need program evaluation to kind of be in that mix to kind of consider it or going forward. But further off, I think one is setting up this task force and what it's going to do for an overhaul and it's going to make those recommendations. And his motion was to recommendation one. But I think recommendations two, three, four, and five um, we need to go ahead and forward the education committees uh, that exist, both education oversight and education approach. I think, I, I would tell you, I think there's some things in here I think can happen faster than any of those uh, that's coming in. Uh, so I think there's some adjustments that can be made kind of now. There's a long-term recommendation for an overhaul coming uh, kind of after this. So I think that's, uh, I would say that in addition to just legislation on recommendation one, I'd like to see us send the other recommendations to the head, and I guess add to that most importantly, approve the report. Uh, we <laughs> tend to miss that. Uh, may I take? Okay. I was going to res respond both to uh, Representative Lucas and and Senator Heiss. Uh, certainly, I would expect, not just hope, I would expect the task force to listen carefully to superintendents and principals that people have to implement and that their input should be critical. But at the end of the day, the decision is ours. Uh, one of the things that I've found amusing since being involved in all of this here in the legislature is that I hear from LEAs about what they want us to do, this, that, or the other, and then they turn around and use that to blame us for, or put the responsibility, well, we can't do that because the legislature won't let us. We become a place for them to hide. And as an example, the long period of time that we had what they call the negative, what was it, where they, We'd give them five million. They to tell them they have to send us back two million. Reverse. Negative, Reverse. negative reserve. What was it? What was it? Reversion. Reverse. The concept behind reversions was you make the cuts where you think they they work for you versus having us thrust the cuts upon them. Well, they didn't like that because they would. The reality is they'd rather have us thrust the cuts upon them so that they didn't have to take the heat for it. Let us take the heat. That's, I think that's the reality of it, that's my, my own view. Well, it's the same thing here that on one hand they want to be involved in how we do this, but they don't want to be held ultimately responsible because remember, they're pumping gas at the gas station every day or several times a week. They shop in the grocery stores. We're here in Raleigh, but they're going to get somebody knocking on their door, pulling on their sleeve right there. They're right there, right in their face. So they look to us to protect them from some of that. At the end of the day, it is our responsibility. Our Constitution clearly puts the responsibility for funding education, the bulk of it, on the state. That's how, we, that's how we're organized. So I understand the value of having and would hope that maybe we, we find a way to, to involve our superintendents and principals, <coughs> listen very carefully to them, but recognize some of their own challenges. Maybe they become ad hoc members so they don't have to entirely take the hit as part of a... Of a. Now, with regard to what Senator Heiss recommends, it seems to me that some of these recommendations, two, three, four, five, are... We can implement those and maybe help a little bit in the near term. But I don't also, at the same time, I'm not so sure we don't confuse the issue and make this whole thing even more difficult as a consequence. And a strategic look based over some period of time, and they've laid out a significant amount of time, 
as long as we get on with it, as is, as in, was in my original motion, clearly puts, begins to put a focus and a commitment to a long-term solution. What I'm afraid of with an interim activity, not that it can't be done, certainly can, is that then the long-term solution gets, gets sort of obfuscated and next thing you know, we've got to say, well, you know, we've actually dealt with that. We don't need this other. We're doing fine. And I, I don't think we're doing fine. And I, don't, I think we're, we need a long-term strategic view and keep focused on the fact that we've got to have a fundamental change in how we, how we support education in this state. So as much as I, I don't really have a problem with amending my, my original motion, as I think through it, right now I do, I, I'm, you wanna run, run an amendment, okay fine, but I'm not happy with it as a friendly amendment, only because I'm really concerned that we're gonna lose focus. But there's no reason that as we get into our committees and in and, and this year and, and, and appropriations that we can't take up some of this, this stuff. But I don't want to obfuscate it. Ms. Byer, I'm sorry, but I, I don't think anything prohibits the appropriations That's committees right. from picking no. these up, brothers. <laughs> but I do think we probably do need to add the accept the report portion to it. <laughs> Endorse. 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 Right. We take some. Okay, I, let me, Senator McGinnis, then Representative Carney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I came here, I served almost nine years on the local school board. And one of the challenges that we fought, because uh, my school was uh, low wealth, high poverty, high teenage pregnancy, 100% uh, uh, free and reduced lunch, all the criteria that we don't want to be, we participated with. And uh, time uh, is, is of the essence. Uh, on this matter as Senator Heiss uh, has uh, so eloquently stated. And, and I believe that uh, quicker rather than slower, uh, we know there's a problem. This General Assembly for the last, uh, uh, for decades, has come up on this issue and kicked the can down the road. And, and it is time, based on the, the majority of states who have changed their methodology for doing it, uh, to, to bring forth uh, something that changes dramatically and and will give a relief for for low wealth counties will will give uh, uh, clarity for metropolitan counties and and uh, we're, we're sitting here uh, today one of my counties has the highest tax rate in the state of North Carolina at a dollar and two cents plus a solid waste fee for used to close the uh, local landfill of 75 or 85 dollars per household then next to that is my good friends uh, who have a, I believe I have a representative here from Moore County, uh, which has a 46 and a half approximately cent tax rate, just next door, just across Drowning Creek from, from there. But yet you, you drill into Moore County, they go up into northern Moore, up the High Falls area, and the, the storefronts are closed, the mills are gone, and, and there are people probably 100% uh, free and reduced lunch within that county. Uh, you, you go from one township to the next with poverty to prosperity. Uh, so we've got to do something, and we've got to do something quickly, uh, lest we uh, harm the, the, the folks that we came here to help, and that's the students. And I've not heard much said about the students today, but I'm interested in what we can do as quickly as we can, in an expeditious manner as possible, uh, to give out the best outcome for the students of uh, North Carolina, because that's ultimately where the rubber gets down the road, and I applaud Again, this committee and this uh, this report, and, and I'm all for moving forward. Uh, Representative Carney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, wrote, I support Senator Heiss and this may adopting the full report because I do think that the education committees um, taking a full look at this in-depth report, and I go back to. Um, what I had said earlier about this is, do we reform or do we totally change everything we're doing? And I do think that's gonna be a question uh, politically going forward. And I agree that um, uh, it, it's interesting that we are one of seven states that still has not 
taken steps forward to either reform what we have or totally change. But I, I do think there's value in this incredible report, the work that's gone into it from both perspectives, that it is shared uh, going forward and with the education committees looking at it. Senator Waddell. Thank you, and I certainly agree with the task force and the 18-member, 20-member task force, but also in that you do state that uh, the need for independent consultation is, could be a component. So I'm hoping that we would really consider that because it would bring in to discussion here some independents, some people who are thinking independently about some issues that they are experts in that would make a great contribution. Um, so hopefully that will be considered as we move forward. And let me mention, as I understand it, there would be nothing to preclude having advisory panels or others associated with this in any event. And I suspect that will clearly occur uh, under the circumstances. Uh, Any other questions from anyone? Uh, Representative Carney. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything else until you brought that up about the advisory. Should we put that into um, the legislation and comprising the, um, the task force and it also be appointed an advisory task force and determine who should be on that task force? I think, as a practical matter, that is implied in any event, but um, uh, um, what the motion is, is to adopt or endorse the report and then proceed with the draft of legislation to identify what this task force would look like and to come back to us for the December 12th meeting. At that point, we may be that 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 I, as I understand it, that is the motion. Is it not? Uh, so I think that that might be something could it could be addressed with more specificity at that time, rather than this time. If that's what I mean, I'm, I'm not precluding that, but I'm just saying you have just have no idea what it would look like. And I think there is there there seems to be a a consensus. In the committee to do something of that sort, but then you get into these. Uh, well, and I think there is. I mean, obviously, individual members of this committee. I mean, these reports are available otherwise to the education committee that oversight. Uh, they probably be considered by either or both in any event. Um, but the real thrust and issue seems to be right now is whether you know we want to move forward with something in, in a, an expeditious manner, and we, which we would not adopt or consider until the December meeting. Is that a fair yeah. statement? Okay. If I may, I'll repeat. Please, my, please. I'll repeat my motion uh, because there needs a little editing, and that is I move that the Joint Legislative Program Evaluation Oversight Committee endorse the report from uh, PD, PD titled to follow and direct staff to prepare a draft bill based on recommendation one of the report for the, De for the December meeting. And so that's my motion and by explanation then that that draft bill or that bill it passed out here then we've still got to have an actual bill and then we'll start flushing those things out as they move through the legislative process. Because I'm sure this is going to attract a lot of attention. Okay. Other questions or comments? See no other questions. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Um, 
Motion's adopted, and we'll have this for December the 12th.